Timothy chapter 3. I want to talk about the pillars of the Christian life today. The pillars of the Christian life. And this is going to be just a little bit of series that has, has five items that I think are very important in the Christian life. We're going to start first with the church. We're going to then go to Bible reading. We're going to go to prayer. We'll talk about soul winning. And Lord winning, we'll talk about giving and the tithe. What that means to the Christian life, I believe they're very important concepts. Christian, in the foundations of their faith, needs to grab a hold of. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible reads in verse 14, These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The pillar and ground of the truth. The first topic we're talking about is exactly that, and that's the church. It's referred to here as the pillar and the ground of the truth. And the interesting thing about a pillar is it starts off way up high, up in heaven. It's also narrow and it's tall, but it reaches down into the ground, founds its foundation, and then that very narrow item, that very narrow object can actually be used to carry great weight. I think it's a great picture of the church itself, and the Bible gives it as such the pillar and ground of the truth. We know the truth to be Jesus Christ himself. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. So as the truth, he has set forth that his pillar and his ground would be the church, and it would be that picture of heaven coming down to earth, finding its foundations, and that foundation is the very church itself. And that's to be, I believe, the foundation of our life as a Christian. We're to be rooted and grounded in the church of the living God, in the house of God, in the pillar and ground of the truth. In other words, if we're to get a hold of the truth, yes, we'll find it in the word. Yes, we'll find Christ revealed there. But he has chosen that the church would be what sets forth that word and sets forth that truth and actually encapsulates and, 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 and maintains and holds who he himself is. So the first thing I want to talk about in regard to the church is that the church, I believe must be local. It must have a local setting, a local um, setting, a local house, a local object. Um, it's got to be local in its, in its workings. Uh, the church of God, which is at Corinth, is one said church that we know of. The church of Galatia, and we see this over and over as we read in the writings of the apostles, that they all were churches, and they all had a home base, a home city, a local place, which they would call its home. The church of the Thessalonians. To Philemon there was a book written, and to the church in thy house, a locality again. To the angel of the church of Ephesus, of Smyrna, of Pergamos, of Thyatira, of Sardis, of Philadelphia, and of the Laodiceans, was where actually the Bible in Revelation writes to these groups, and they were actually localities. They were actually groups that were local, and that's where the churches were set up. So we see then there isn't this one universal church that so many want to talk about in various religions. One group of believers, one body. But rather, there are various churches in various different locations. All of these have their own purpose, have their own place, and have their own locality for which they are responsible, I believe, to reach. So, this side of heaven, it is my firm belief that there is no such thing as a universal church, but rather, like I said, various churches in various places. If you would, you can turn with me even to Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll see another side of what the church means, or just listen along as you will. Paul, Ephesians 1 and verse 1 says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. A few pages over in the book of Colossians says something similar. It says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi with the bishops and the deacons. And again, a few pages over in, Philipp, in uh, Colossians, sorry, you find Paul, the apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy as our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae. So we see then, 
The church is always associated, or each individual church is always associated with a town, a city, a location, a geographical location, if you will. But it's also, when they write, they write to specifically the saints and the faithful in this area and at this time. And uh, it's, it's very clear about this. Um, as you read about, yes, the faithful and the saints at Ephesus, at Colossae, at Philippi, um, you get the picture that the church isn't just a locality, it isn't just um, a geographical location, but it's actually something that is made up of believers. Acts chapter 2, the Bible reads, in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 41, Acts chapter 2, verse 41. <clears throat> They that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and break of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul and as many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common. And it continues there at the end in verse 47. It says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So the church then is made up of faithful. It's made up of saints. It's made up of believers because those that received the word were added to the church. As many as were saved were added to the church daily, the Bible says here. But it is in a location. It is in a locality. And that's the next point I want to get to is that the saints and faithful are those that make up the church. Now, quite often we see that there are people that go to church, but they're not necessarily at all times part of the church. And what do I mean by that? Do I mean that there should be some sort of membership role? Do I mean that people need to sign up, sign in, stamp, put their name on it, give a membership fee or something like that? No, what I mean is that the Bible is written to the saints and the faithful and to individual churches in locations all across um, the area at this time that the Bible was written in the Middle East. But there were some, I believe, and even today, that are saints that go to church, but they're not necessarily part of the church. Why? Because they're not faithful. Now, that doesn't mean that they, as some say, that they have to be believers who are baptized in all cases, because some people fight that. But I believe if you go to church long enough, you're going to be compelled by those that are believers there that, hey, you haven't been baptized, you need to get baptized. But the church... Someone that is a part of the church is actually physically here as often as they can be within the congregation, within the group, working and striving together. It's to the saints and the faithful. It's not just to the saints that the Bible was written in this case, but those that sometimes go to church aren't necessarily being a part of the church. We should all strive to be a part of the body for which God has called us to be a part of. Now, practically speaking, some people tend to be less faithful in that area. And there's all sorts of reasons why somebody wouldn't necessarily always find their place in the church when the church is meeting. But we see then this picture that comes forward where the church is represented as a body. And this is when we see that that whole idea of being faithful and a saint and in one accord and together when the meeting happens, when the congregation comes together as being pivotal and being very important. If you look to uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians in chapter 12, is this blinding you guys? 1 oh. Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to get that picture of the church as a body in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look in verse 12. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. For the Spirit is not one member, but many, or sorry, for the body is not one member, but many. So many members make up that body. And this is the body of Christ that's being referred to here. This is what I was talking about when I said that there is, um, in eternity future, a universal, a one body of Christ that all of the church is made up of, though it doesn't exist now at this time. 
In verse 18 it says, But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members and yet one body. So we see here then that that picture of Christ as the body of church in heaven is now being downplayed, is now being pictured now in the earth. And as we are in Christ, and then therefore many members of that body, so now is the church in the same respect. Verse 27 says this, Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular, and God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, and it continues down. Now what I want to notice there is it says, now ye are the body of Christ. We all understand that we make up the body of Christ. We are in Christ as believers. But then it points down to this idea. It says, and God hath set some in the church. So now ye are the body of Christ set in the church, which I believe functions as a body in of itself. Now the church as the body, and here's the picture of how some can be um, maybe go to church but not necessarily be a part of church because you need to be a saint and as it says back here we are baptized into that one body in Christ now when we come together in that one that uniform member that one group that one body of believers how important then do you see that it's important that they be saved first and foremost yes but also faithful Imagine if members come and go in a body. Imagine if you wake up and your leg just isn't working. It's, it's a miserable thing. You wake up and one of your eyes isn't there. That's how it feels, honestly, when somebody is not present in the body, in the church, in the congregation. It feels as if something is missing, and indeed something is missing. So when people are placed in the body, as the Bible says, by Christ, when Christ has set forth some apostles, some teachers, some, right? God has set some in the church for all of these different needs, helps being one of them, healings being one of them, governments, diversity of tongues, all the different needs that a body has, when God sets them in there and that member doesn't show up, it hurts the body. This is why it's so important that as a church, we are both saints. Yes, absolutely. Everyone's got to be a believer. Understood. We also have to be faithful. We also have to be present. We also have to be part of the body in performing our particular function, our particular responsibility. And now as that, as that illustration plays out as it being bodies, we need to then remember and recognize that there are indeed many bodies amongst the world. We saw that there's different churches all over these localities, and we saw that every city in the Bible anyways had a respective church or churches within that locality, but they are independent of themselves. In the same way, God sets forth the church in that manner, where there are independent bodies all over the place, and each have their own hand, each have their own foot, each have their own head. And that illustration plays out really well because we can imagine what it would be like were there to be two heads, were there to be three left arms, were to be all these different things, or were there to be missing parts, or whether it would all come together and the different needs, and that's what I see. I often see these great big churches where there's 15 people that know how to play the piano. Well, in my opinion, it's time that that body procreates and spreads out. There may be all different people that would perform the role of a left hand. Well, why do you need that many? Then it should be that it expands. It goes forward. And more independent bodies, I believe, are created. And that's the next point I want to bring forth, is that it's an independent. So we see that the church is local. The church is full of saints and faithful Christians. It's also to be independent. And this is uh, the problem that I see too often. Um, and this is the reason why the independent Baptists initially were born. Many of them came from what was known as the Southern Baptist Convention. There was a denomination. There was a, there was a group of them that were all yoking together and working for the same purpose and the same goal. But the devil, though he doesn't know the Bible, I, I, though he un knows the Bible very well, he doesn't necessarily understand all points of the Bible, but a very simple concept plays forth in Isaiah chapter 1, where that if the head is sick, the whole heart is sick, the whole body is sick, if just the head is sick. And this is why it's important that churches be independent, because if there is one head, and I got a little picture here where there's one head and then there's three little stick figures coming off of it, there's one head, but they make up various bodies, 
All the devil has to do is make the head sick, and he has just affected three different bodies. Does that make sense? And this is where I believe the satellite method of planting churches absolutely falls short. And I believe we've witnessed that a little bit recently. Now, this is what I feel is the best way of setting up a church, is that it would be independent, first and foremost, off the bat. Okay? Now, this doesn't always work out. But if you must send out somebody who isn't necessarily ready, and this is our situation right now, I will admit that I am not ready to pastor a church, so I've placed myself under the authority of my sending church, but we are here as an independent body. My church does not oversee. My pastor does not oversee this body. He doesn't oversee you guys. He doesn't know your, your, your prayers, your wishes, your hopes, your dreams. He doesn't guide you and lead you. He's not here to do that. But he is overseeing me because I have admitted that I'm not ready. And through his ministry to me, he has recognized that I'm not ready. So as we talked and as we worked it out together, his decision for me and my decision to yield to that was that for a time, I would still attend church down there as I am ministering to the best of my ability in Toronto. As I grow to the point where I am capable of being the head over top of an independent body. But when you do this satellite method, if the head is infected, and we already witnessed that a little bit, the whole of the bodies underneath that head fall down. I don't necessarily think it's wrong to set up a satellite church, but I believe there needs to be a narrow window for which that person needs to be under the foresight of it. This is the reason why the Independent Baptist left the Southern Baptist Convention, because the convention as the head became sick. And all the bodies started to become sick. And a few of them said, you know what, I'm out. Forget it. We're going independent. Why do we reject denominationalism? Because the denomination dictates, divvies out the money, handles everything of all the bodies underneath it. If you affect that denomination, as all of them are affected out there in the world right now, if that head is sick, the whole body is sick. Amen. Why do we oppose Bible colleges? It's the exact same reason. I am now, today, in opposition to Bible colleges. There may have been a time when they were a respectable, decent way of growing pastors and preachers and sending them out in order to start churches, but the head became sick. And now you have that same thing happening, whereas they send out churches and, and pastors and preachers and evangelists and all that from that one body, it is infected by all of the bad doctrine that's within it, and all of the bodies underneath that head become infected. We need to be independent, if not right away, as soon as possible. Every single body of Christ, every single local church needs to be, I believe, 100% independent. Amen. And if it is not fitting to do that right away, give it some time, but give it a narrow window of time, whereby you're almost immediately getting someone planted, set up, training them up, and ready to go. We are independent. Thereby, if my pastor of Lighthouse Baptist goes wrong, Things will change around here in so much that I will be affected by it and I will have to wheel and deal and try to figure out how I can move forward with this independent body. But you guys won't be affected by that. In the same way, if we, when we get everything in line and established and we start moving and things hit the ground running, if I go bad, I can be thrown out of here and you guys remain an independent body and then you have to set up means and ways of dealing with the certain issues. There's no reason why my pastor then would need to come and get involved and there's no reason again in the flip side why he would then affect what's happening here except that I wouldn't have then somebody overseeing me and leading me. Now where God forbid that were ever to the case I would do exactly what I'm doing right now. I would seek out someone to mentor me, to grow me, to help me to get to a point where I can lead you guys effectively on my own with Christ as the head. Because ultimately that's the bottom line is that every church needs to have Christ as the head. And when we take and we place a man in between us and Christ, when we place a group, when we place a denomination in between us and Christ, we're, we're barely a church anymore. We, we, we've fallen short of the bottom line of the most important thing is that Christ is the head to the church. Remember, Christ is the truth, and the pillar and ground of the truth is, is the church. 
And so the truth needs to be filtered through the church with Christ as the head, with, with Christ dictating, with Christ proving, with Christ setting forth all the commandments and all the requirements and all the needs and all of his desires upon, yes, the leadership who is then reporting simply directly to him. And that body gathers themselves around the leadership in one accord and moves forward with that same goal. You know, follow me as I follow Christ. And that's my only goal for this is that I would lead, I would lead you as much as I'm following Christ. And as much as I'm following Christ, I would hope that you would want to follow me because your goal is Christ and my goal is Christ. And this church's goal is Christ. And that's it. And that's why I believe that churches need to be local. And that's what we have here. We have a local North York Toronto area church. I believe it needs to be made up of saints who are faithful, of faithful saints who are here, who are committed, who are dedicated. There will be visitors come and go. There will be people come and go. But the body itself needs to be made up of that core people, that core group. Someone who's got to be the right hand, someone who's got to be the left hand, someone who's got to be the seeing, the hearing, all the different helps that are needed. They're very important to the church. I understand sometimes schisms will happen down the line, but they shouldn't be so. The body should maintain itself, and the body should be the same. I believe we have that here. And the next thing that I want to bring to the highest point is that it is to be independent. And I want to even rename it, not independent Baptist church, but how about this? God-dependent Baptist church. Because honestly, we don't want to be independent. We don't want to be self-dependent. We don't want to be um, self-motivated. We want to be God-dependent. We want everything that we do in this body, in this church, to be dependent on the, on the precepts, on the command, on the goals, on the desires of the living God. We need to be a God-dependent Baptist church. So we're talking about five pillars of the Christian life, and the first, I believe, is the church, and, and church attendance, and church um, membership, in so much that you are here, you're present, you're faithful, you are a part of the body. And it's great to start the church, because that is the pillar and the ground of the church. I believe that Christ set forth the church as the foundation. He even bought it with his own blood, the Bible records. So why church then? Well, first and foremost, if you turn to Hebrews chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, why church? Why church for the Christians? Hebrew chapter 10 says this in verse 23. <clears throat> Hebrews 10 and verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Not forsaking the assembly. So the Bible here says in verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, and continues that thought when it says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. The profession, the holding fast, the faith, the considering of one another is all dependent upon the not forsaking does that make sense? Is, is that visible there? We need to be together to encourage and strengthen one another. So first and foremost, I believe it is a command for us to be in church, to be in the congregation, to be in the body as faithfully as we possibly can. The next reason you'll see it right there is exhortation and exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. So why church? Why do we need church? Why does a Christian need to go to church for exhortation? Right there the Bible says provoking one another to love and good works. That's the major motivation for me quite often is yes, God commands me to be in church. I ought to obey God. But if we're simply just obeying God, we quite often get that grudgery kind of feeling to it. But if we are going for the purpose of exhortation, if we're going for the purpose of provoking one another and being provoked unto love and good works, that's really where the Christian life in the church gets its friction. That's where it really gets some, some speed. That's where, that's where things really start flowing. Why? Because I go to church not because I have to go to church. I go to church because I get to go to church, because I like church, because I enjoy God's people. I enjoy giving exhortation. I enjoy being exhorted. All to the purpose that I would love more and I would do more good works. That's the purpose of the church, and we see that here. Don't forsake that, as the manner of some is. 
Don't, don't push away. Don't, don't leave that behind. Don't find some other thing, some other means of getting that exhortation or of getting that, that fix of spirituality. No, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together. In order to assemble together, you need to get together. You need to be face to face with real flesh and blood people. Imagine that. It's a command. It's, it's for exhortation. The next thing that you see, if you turn to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, is that it's for perfecting. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, the Bible says, And he gave some apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so we see then that edification coming back in. And the purpose then here we see of the church, of the apostles coming together, the prophets coming together. They're all given by God. The evangelists coming together, the pastors and teachers, everyone coming together. The purpose is for perfecting of saints. We are here, one another, together. I'm here, you're here, to perfect one another, to complete one another, to help one another grow unto perfection. Amen. We're here to work the work of the ministry. We're here to edify one another within the body of Christ to the end that we would be perfect, that we would be complete, that we would be full, well-rounded individuals in Christ. Number four, for safety, look there in verse 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So right before that in verse 13 it says, We are perfecting until we come into the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, unto that perfect man, unto the measure and stature of the fullness of Christ. Obviously, that's a long way off. I am nowhere near the measure and stature of Christ himself. But that fullness is where we are approaching to. And we won't approach into that, and we won't actually reach that until we either leave in this world or, or, uh, or Christ takes us home, right? But once we are perfect, once we know God, once we see Him and are known even as He is known, and we are face to face with Him, we are now complete. Nothing to worry about. Perfect. Everything's great. But look at that verse in number 14. It says that we henceforth be no more children. It talks about being tossed to and fro. It talks about being caught about in winds of doctrine. It talks about the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. So there is some that are lying in wait to deceive. And until we're perfect, and until we're incorruptible, and until it's not possible that it be deceived, the body is here to perfect us. The body is here to exhort us. And it's here for our own safety. It's here to keep us straight. It's here to keep us level. It's here to keep us on the right playing field and not go off on the, to, to flat earth or Nephilim or other, tar, other retarded theories, right? It's here to keep us established in, in, in the truth of Christ until we are full, until are we, we are, are, are full of the knowledge and in the unity of the faith. God puts us in the body so that we're not tossed about. So that we're not just children running about. We're not just scattered. We're not just hurt. We're not just confused. We're here for safety. So why church? It's a command for exhortation, for, for perfecting, for safety. Number five, because it's natural. Look at verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up. And I like that idea of growing up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So there we see Christ as the head of the church from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So the edifying of itself in love, it almost talks about the nourishing, which it says when the joints are supplying and the effectual working of every part, the growing up into him, the truth that is constantly being spoken, it creates this edifying of love within itself. And so it's natural. So as we get together, the Bible here records that we are growing. 
The Bible here records that we are, we are fitly joined together and compacted by the joints which bond us together as different members of the body. We are increasing within that body, edifying ourselves in love. It's just a natural flow. It's just a natural way the body nourishes one another. In the same way, your body, if you stub your toe, is going to send backup. It's going to send support. It's naturally going to find ways to heal that injury. That's the same way the body of Christ moves. We naturally have compassion one for another. So when Brother Yuri here is fearing for his sister, we all fear for his sister. And we get together and supply through the joints by which we are bonded helps to him. Need, uh, desire, things that he's desiring, we, we try to fulfill those needs. We try to get behind him, even in prayer, in support and encouraging words. Anything that would help and encourage and strengthen that part of the body that is falling, that part of the body that is hurting, that part of the body that is lacking in any way. Naturally, the body that is joined together in unity will support that. So it's a command. It's, a, it's for exhortation, for perfecting, for safety. It's natural. The next thing that I want you to see is that we need to be in church because we're family. John chapter 1, we use this all the time, that, as many, that if you believe, you're the son of God. If you have trusted in Jesus, you are now his child. And so we all need to remember that we are children of God. We are family. If you look just across the page in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14, the Bible says, For this cause I bow the knee, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So while we're not flesh and blood family here, we're flesh and blood family up in heaven. It's settled. That, that, that's just how it is. We are born sons of God by the new birth, by the second birth. Our new man is related. We are family. That's another reason why we need to be in church. We need to be family. We need to come together. We need to seek one another often. We need to be together just like any family normally is. The next thing that I want to point out, if you would, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> why church? 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9 says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So a side point is that the church should come together here and they should just show forth the praises of God who pull us out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's a lot better to praise God when you're in, in, a, in a large group, to just sing out uh, and to show praises unto God. It just, it just feels great to be in unity with the body of Christ singing praises unto him. So that's a side point, but the point I really want to focus in on is not only is it a command to be in church, not only is it for the perfecting, for safety, for exhortation, because it's natural, because we're family one of another. The other reason why we need to be in church is because you're peculiar. Let's face it, who else wants to hang out with you? <laughs> right? We're peculiar. We're strange. We're, we're individuals in Christ that maybe we lived one way and we acted one way and behaved one way at some point, but now is the peculiar treasure, the royal priesthood. Christ has pulled us out of that darkness into his marvelous light, and now you're peculiar to the world. You're strange. You're unusual. You're, you're different. There's something different about you. You used to do all these things. You used to party with me. You used to sell. You used to be cool, man, but now you're peculiar, right? I wouldn't use that word because that's, that's, a, that's a fancy theological word. We like that word, peculiar. But it's true. Yeah. Who else wants to hang out with you? And, and who else do you want to hang out with but the peculiar children of God? Yeah. It's good for the church to be together. Why? Because when we're peculiar together, hey, we're normal. <laughs> Suddenly when we get together in the body, we're not peculiar anymore. Well, some of us, I don't know. <laughs> but the reality is, is that when peculiar comes together with peculiar, hey, there's unity. We're together. Suddenly we can talk. And I don't know if you've ever been in a group of people, maybe not in a church uh, situation, but whenever you've met somebody at the door and... and uh, and uh, me and Miss Alex met Ola yesterday, and, and at the door we're talking to him about 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 Christ, about God, and, and you know he just he just starts saying you know it's grace through faith, it's a free gift, you know I don't have to do anything for it, I'm I'm saved because of Jesus, even if I go and live a rotten life, and, and he just test, and we just kept talking at his door, just just talking, lifting up the Lord, talking about how things are in his country, all sorts of different things. We had this initial bond. If someone was to walk by, and if you did, they'd be like, man, those guys are. 
peculiar. They're weird. They're strange. Why are they talking about this stuff in a hallway? We didn't care. We were knit. We were in, we were in love. We were in the love of God as we expressed ourselves to one another and encouraged one another where we were at. This is why we need to be in church. This is one of the pillars of the church. Or this is one of the pillars, rather, of the Christian life. Church, Bible reading, prayer, soul winning, and giving or the tithe. Those are the things I want to talk about as we go forward. But the first, the pillar, the foundation of the truth is that we would be in church. We would be together. We would be unified in that cause and in the common goal to serve Christ. And if we do that, this is when the other ideas of the pillar, Christ, the pillars of the Christian life start to come to fruition. They start to come together. Why? Because we learn the truth here, and then we go apply the truth, the other truths, as we go and as we follow on Christ. Thank you, Father, for this day. I thank you for the word.